Lipstick stains accompanied his shirts. The smell of another woman on his body overpowered his usual man scent. The different odor of shampoo in his hair piqued my interest. My boyfriend, Jesse, was cheating, and he didn't hide it. I knew it because I was once the lover with whom he cheated on his ex-girlfriend. I should have known that he wouldn't last with me. I should have known that he was created to be a cheat. I wanted to be angry with him, to confront him, lash at him, and dispel my aches. I longed to remind him of the love we shared, the children we could have, and the joy in a home we could build. But I decided against it. Rather than show him my weakness, I decided to leverage my strength. A trick-or-treat show. It didn't matter that it wasn't Halloween. I told Fiona to tail Jesse. Fiona had been my friend since I was 10 years old. She was the only one who understood me when everyone called me weird. She stood by me, fought for me, or I fought for her. When I told her of my suspicion and showed her evidence that Jesse was cheating, she was all too ready to track him and find out who the bitch was. She caught the woman sooner than I thought, and the show came up quicker. On that day, I called Jesse early and told him to keep dinner time free because I had a special announcement for him. During the day, Fiona and I went on a girl's day out. It was a full makeover, from the spa to getting my facials done, to the manicure and pedicure, and finally, to the hairstylist. I looked exquisite for the occasion. Jesse dared not look at another woman. I arrived at his place late in the evening. He looked impatient and didn't hug me. I kept my anger at bay. Nothing to spoil the show, so I was forced to act natural. He questioned my presence, and I told him to relax. He asked for dinner plans, and I told him I had food packs. Even if he was disappointed, he didn't voice it. I was glad that he respected me. I settled into one of the couches that occupied the sitting room and turned on the television. A few minutes later, he asked, Why are you even here? It was the question I was waiting for, the magic words that began the show. Want to play a game? I said and flashed my teeth at him. He cringed. I was irritated by his reaction, but I kept my smile plastered. What kind of game, Linda? Did you come to play a game here? You can do that at the game house, he hissed. It's not a game house kind of game. Don't you think I'm a little too old to be seen in a game house? 28 years isn't old, Linda. What do you want? Trick or treat? I smiled and pushed away my anger. That could wait for later, or maybe never. Trick or treat? The look on his face was alarming. It took all my strength not to laugh. It's not even Halloween, and what kind of game is that? Just choose, Jesse. Do you want to be tricked, or do you want a treat? I moved closer to where he sat and tickled his chin. Trick, he said, and I smiled. I turned off the television and motioned for the light switch but changed my mind. It was better to see the reaction in his eyes while I tricked him. Brace for this. I stood and got on my knees, closed my eyes, and held my hands together tightly. Did you hear about Maddie? I rushed at him and watched his eyes for any reaction. Maddie? Who's Maddie? I sat beside him, sympathy filling my eyes. Maddie is one of Fiona's neighbors. Indeed she was. Jesse's new lover didn't live so far. There was an accident. She was murdered. Murdered? I loved to see the color drain from Jesse's eyes. I loved the way his cheeks were flabby when he swallowed hard. I loved the reaction my story gave him, and my insides danced. W what do you mean by she was murdered? What happened? He stood up. It's so sad. Fiona got back home and met some officers moving in and out of one of the buildings on her street. She inquired from one of the onlookers, and this was the story. Maddie, the young lady, woke up from sleep and was shouting, screaming at the top of her voice for help, but no one could hear. Her screams were muffled by pillows. The murderer suffocated her and watched intently as every form of life escaped from her eyes. The murderer watched her struggle, shake and wiggle. It was a horrific sight to behold. As if that wasn't bizarre enough, the murderer took a knife and cut her into a million pieces. He washed a few pieces, boiled them, fried them, and packed them away. Her remains were found in the apartment. Such a sad story. I shook my head and looked at Jesse. He was staring at me with blank eyes, and his hands were shaking. Uh, the onlookers told you that? Mm-hmm. 
I shook my head in response and Jesse moved backward, taking slow steps away from me. I burst into laughter. You don't believe me, do you? His eyes were confused and I kept laughing. Trick served, I said and laughed harder. He breathed out loudly and sighed. <sighs> Linda, don't you do that to me again. I chuckled. It's the way I dreamed of murdering whoever you cheat on me with. I smacked my lips and winked at him. He didn't react. Since I have served my trick, it is time for your treat. I grinned while retrieving the food packs I brought with me the other time. Jesse sat beside me and unpacked the food. He frowned at the contents. A few pieces of fried meat for dinner? Linda? He scoffed. But I thought men liked to eat their women for dinner. I made sure to sound defeated and watched with relish as Jesse linked the story. Of course, it wasn't any trick. How else could I have described the murder of Maddie so vividly if I didn't commit the murder? If I wasn't the one who cut her flesh into pieces and packed it for dinner at Jesse's house while the police uncovered a mystery that would never get solved. Jesse stood and tried to flee the room, but I pulled him over to myself and sat him down while rubbing his head. He shivered in my hands and begged for his life. I looked into his eyes and said, It's okay, Jesse. You're safe with me. We'll get married and give birth to the best of children. Just don't cheat on me again, and no one will die. That's how you take care of a cheating boyfriend. I think the first time that I saw her, she was wearing different contact lenses for each eye. One was blue, and the other was gray. I still think I never found out what the color of her real eyes were. She was standing at the fuel station, filling her car with gas when I drove up with Nathan in my car. I watched her, intrigued by everything about her. She was slim with tiny shoulders, but well-rounded hips. Her chest had, in front of them, sizable melons, and though she was not wearing any bra, they stood up so firmly. Nathan watched my eyes and turned back to me. Don't think about it, he said. What was there not to think about? Okay, maybe I had a girlfriend. But since when had Nathan been concerned about that? He disliked her. A lot of times I would want to go out with Nathan, but she would not let me. It was tiring. Maybe I would have broken up with her if I was not living in her house. My girlfriend was not the problem, according to Nathan. He knew the girl. She practiced some sort of voodoo. He had had a lot of friends talk about how they were afraid of going near her. I chuckled. It was silly, the talk of voodoo. Bracing myself, I stepped out of the car and walked towards her. She focused so intently on filling her gas tank as if she wanted me to take a cue and go away. But I was not to be dissuaded. Getting her number was the first step. It was not so difficult. I realized she had a lovely smile after I made a couple of jokes. When I got back to the car, her contact was saved in my phone as Ira. Nathan shook his head. He had been moving with some unfortunate folks who wanted to turn his head upside down. I filled the gas and left, making a mental note to call Ira as soon as I dropped off Nathan at his house. In front of Nathan's house, before he got out of the car, he turned to me. Hey, leave that girl. You don't want to mess with her. Fuck that, I said. Off he went, obviously tired of trying to convince me. The girl was beautiful, and I wanted to get laid. My girl had started giving me some attitude, pushing me away whenever I tried to initiate something. Not blaming her for any of this shit, but I just wanted someone whose internal warmness would grab my hardness. <laughs> I called Ira on the phone. At the other end, her phone rang for a long time and nothing happened. No one came to the phone. It went straight to voicemail. I looked down at my phone, one hand at the steering wheel, wondering if she had given me her number or someone else's. The sound of a car horn pulled me out of my pondering. I looked up quickly to realize that I had strayed to the other side of the road. There was an oncoming lorry blasting its horn in my face. Quickly, I swerved from that side, turning all the way to the right. The car careened off the road and only came to a halt after I had stamped on the brake a couple of times. On the road, the lorry zoomed past, blowing cold wind my way, death narrowly missing me. My heart was pounding, and in my ears, Nathan's words rang. You don't want to mess with her. I took deep breaths, trying to calm myself. It was my fault. I had taken my eyes off the road, I thought, trying to convince myself. There was nothing voodoo about this. 
The radio screeched and came on. I started. There was a song coming off the radio, one that I did not recognize. Two red eyes in the dark. There was the metallic sound of guitars and one of the singers screaming like a demon-possessed man. I quickly hit the radio, turning it off. It must have been broken, I decided, still heaving. Some would say the signs were there, but I willfully ignored them all and went ahead to plan a meeting with the girl. It was outside, and she still had those contact lenses in her eyes. That night, her lips begged for a kiss. Beautiful, shapely red cherries. I held back instead, making small talk and attempting to win her over. My girl would not care if I came back that night or not. The rift between us was already a mile long. You should come to my place, Iris said after laughing at my joke. Really? When? I asked. Now. Come on. There was no reason to suspect anything, not with that shapely bum already bouncing in front of me on its way out of the restaurant. I stood up quickly and followed. She was wearing a tight, red gown that clung to her shape, outlining every curve and making me want to run my hands along them. When we got to her house, she shut the door right after I got inside, turned to me, and planted a kiss on my lips without warning. She pressed her body against mine, pushing me to the wall. Then she broke off abruptly and walked towards the room. I followed. There was a metallic song playing on her radio. At the time, the sound was familiar, but I was so consumed by lust to notice anything. In the room, she turned off the light, lured me to her bed, and laid on top of me, kissing madness into me. Before she got off, I heard the sound of something clicking. When I tried to hold her, I realized that I had been tied to the bedposts. My heart skipped a beat. I will be right back, she said, her voice reassuring. Yet it was hard for me to push down the panic that was building inside of me. The room was dark and only got brightened when she opened the bathroom door to get it. She shut it, and I was in the darkness again. Then my wait began. It felt like hours, days even. Something hissed along the bed, and cold fear washed over me. I looked around the darkness, chilly hands gripping my spine. Then I saw it, a pair of two red eyes in the dark staring at me. I screamed, but the eyes continued to stare. Then I felt them getting closer. Ira! I screamed. There was no use. For all I know, she could be the one in her true form coming for me. Nathan's words banged against my ears. I could hear the music in the house clearly now. It was the same as the one that came on in my car. Ira! The red eyes were almost upon me now. I could see the end in those eyes. They seemed like they had a history of a world that I did not know. A world of pain. The bathroom door was pushed open then and light flooded into the room like salvation. What's wrong? Ira asked, stepping into the room. She was wearing her things, and her body still looked like they were made for sin, but I would be damned if I would sleep with the devil. Well, the red eyes turned out to be those of her pet snake, locked in a cage on the table. I had only imagined them coming closer to me. Still, I had her uncuff me from the bed and was on my way. My car radio might be broken, The song at her house might be a coincidence, and the red eyes might belong to some stupid, non-poisonous snake, but I felt it was better to heed Nathan's advice on this one. She told me her age the first day we met. We didn't meet physically. We met on Snapchat. The app was fast becoming my favorite. I was a lonely and horny teenager. Anna was a sleek and gorgeous 25-year-old. Even though we met on Snapchat, I didn't see her face often. To be specific, I saw it once and didn't see it again. Not after the first day, but that was enough to draw my attention and curiosity. I saw other parts of her body. Sometimes it was her flawless legs. Other times it was the side of her face and her sumptuous neck. Another time it was her cleavage and breasts neatly tucked in an off-shoulder top. I grew addicted to her such that when she invited me to her house, I jumped. An invitation like that was one in a million, and I wasn't about to throw it away. Day after day, I prepared myself and my body for the visit I had anticipated since we met. If I was to describe her from our first e-meeting, 
she possessed a round face and small lips. Her eyes were pretty and full of mischief. I loved them. She was red-haired, and I was a big sucker for red hair, especially with the name Anna. The truth is, I fell for her from that day and fell harder when I saw her body. My heart pounded harder with every picture of hers I added to my gallery. This was all the more reason I couldn't wait to see her. I anticipated confessing my love, and I hoped she would agree to be my girlfriend, despite the age difference. I hadn't told my friends yet. They were not fans of meeting people online, and I wanted to make sure she would agree to love me before I told them about it. When the day to visit arrived, I stole out of my parents' house and took a cab to the address she sent in the message. The house was in a rather isolated area. It felt spooky with the pine trees all around, but I didn't mind. My beloved was inside there somewhere. I knocked on her door and awaited a response. It took a while, but a chubby blonde opened the door and her face carried confusion at first, then a knowing. I smiled at her and related my purpose. I asked for Anna, and she smiled, a sad kind of smile. Don't panic, I told myself. There's no way she was Anna. My Anna was slender, and she wasn't Anna. I know because she told me herself. She said her name was Diana. She invited me into the house, and I gladly entered. The house was furnished with a pretty couch and tiny pillows. There were beautiful pictures on the wall, but only Diana was visible. If there were any other persons in a picture, their face was either blurred or cut out. But I didn't ask. I didn't care. I only cared for Anna. After a patient five minutes, Diana prepared some tea and served it to me. I took a sip and breathed in before blurting out my demand to see Anna. Diana broke down in tears. Though I was confused, my heart broke down to see her cry. Maybe she wasn't the red-haired I was looking for, but I had grown fond of her in the little minutes we spent together. I didn't love her, though. I loved Anna. When she relaxed, I asked about Anna again, and also asked why she cried. She said she cried because of Anna. Anna had been her only cousin and her best friend. Their parents gave birth to them on the same day. While Diana was born at midnight, Anna was born at 11.59 p.m. Diana was older than her by exactly 23 hours and 59 minutes. They grew up together, attended the same schools, and chose the same university. But it all ended when Anna died two years ago. I couldn't contain my ears, and so I asked again. I wasn't looking for some dead Anna. I was in search of Anna, who had been chatting and sharing pictures with me in the last few days. I told her that it was Anna who invited me to that house that day. Diana nodded in understanding and retrieved her phone from the stool beside her. She scrolled through it and turned it towards me. A full picture of Anna filled her screen and I nodded. That was the Anna I sought. It was the same picture she sent me on the day we met. Diana nodded and started to cry again. I understood from that moment, somehow that I had been chatting with a dead lady. You're the third guy, she said. The third guy that has come looking for Anna. The third guy that has rekindled the memory of my loss and sent me once again into mourning. My head spun in its space, and my eyes rolled out of their own will. The news broke my heart, but the spinning was not of my own volition. It wasn't because of the news either. My heart pounded in my chest and I felt dizzy. I rose to my feet and willed myself to walk out of the house and head back home. My lover was non-existent after all, and even if I wanted to comfort Diana, I didn't have the ability. I wanted to mourn by myself, but I staggered at every attempt to stand. Diana stood up and helped me. I guess she thought I grieved for her cousin. I loved her courage. I muttered some words about leaving the house but I wasn't sure if she understood. I suppose she did because she led me towards the door. But there were two doors. I thought it was dizziness, but it didn't seem like it. Because the closer I was, the clearer it became and I couldn't make out which led outside. I didn't bother myself though. 
Diana was helping me out, and who knew the house better than the owner? She pushed open a door and kicked me in. I didn't need any explanations. I was drugged. So were the two guys tied down in the corners of the red room. The room was painted red, and pictures of Anna were everywhere. I tried to crawl out, but the door was shut behind me, and Diana wore a sly smile. She sauntered to the middle of the room and said, You can't leave the house without seeing Anna. I hated her voice at that moment. I wanted to think about the situation, but I was too weak. She kicked a bucket in the center of the room, and I crawled over. My knees hurt and my entire body was weak. I finally made it to the bucket, and in it were the body parts of Anna. I recognized them because they were the parts in the pictures I received on Snapchat. Diana tried to kick me in the head, but I dodged and she fell on, her head hitting the edge of the metal bucket. It was then I mustered all the energy I could and fled out of the house. I made an emergency call to the police and mumbled my problem, hoping they would hear. They did because I woke up the next day. No, three days after. That's what the police officer beside me in the hospital ward said. Diana was caught and her hostages released. The officer told me that Diana hated her cousins since childhood because Anna was always popular amongst men. Anna would often make fun of her and Diana ended up killing her in revenge. While I was glad to be alive, Diana's backstory made my blood run cold. After that day, I removed every trace of mine from social media and have since tried to move on from that horrific event.